Oh, Garland Nixon, Andre Martiano, if I always have trouble with that, and Scott Ritter. We got plenty to talk about. Bakhmut, Transnistria, all kinds of stuff. Let's talk. gentlemen um you know i i i really enjoy uh you know uh working with you guys i, I you know whenever either one of you guys are, are online i always uh, watch your stuff and I always learn a lot so i'm looking forward to tonight and it's a it, it, it's really a great a great night i mean in some in a, in a horrifying and frightening way uh because there's a lot going on let's start off with what, what i think is the big one and that is transnistria so apparently the ukrainians are gathering uh, troops and all kinds of stuff around Transnistria. There's a huge um, depot, arms depot there that's been there since, apparently since the end of uh, the Cold War. And I'm thinking a lot of that stuff probably isn't usable. Uh, but at any rate, so there seem to there seems to be a move afoot to broaden the war. Now, I'll just say this and we'll start with Andre. I read some stuff that basically the um, the Russian uh, Ministry of Defense has said, look, if they do that, we'll consider that an act of war. And my thought was, this is a spe special military operation. War is something totally different. And they're saying it's not going to be the same game if you do that. It broadens the war. It's a very dangerous thing to do. Let's start with you, uh, Andre. Your thought on what's happening with Transnistria and will uh, Ukraine and, you know, uh, make that move? Uh, well, uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's a pleasure to be here with Scott and you, Garland. It's obviously a privilege, really. Um, the issue here is that it wasn't just the defense ministry. It was also the foreign ministry. And it was stated in uh, very clear terms that it will be considered as the attack on Russia proper. And in this case, it's good enough, uh, I think, warning. Uh, there is around, I would say, um, 6,000 plus minus give and take. I never really tracked it down of Russian regular troops. And of course, there are also people of Transnistria who are could be very well armed and dangerous. But uh, I think so that uh, uh, Transnistria was that this 800-pound uh, gorilla in the room since the, I don't know, you know, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, pretty much. And everybody knew that it was to a degree uh, vulnerable. There's very little depth there, operational depth to defend. As for this arsenal, which they uh, talk about, I think so. some of it was, it's a former uh, army, uh, 40th Army, actually, I believe, uh, commanded by, at that at some point of time, by Mr. Levitz, late Mr. Levitz. Uh, so uh, some of it could be pretty useful still, you know, depending on the type of the weaponry. So, and um, will they do it? Possible. How probable it is? I'm talking about Ukraine. I'm not in the position now to uh, give any assessment until we know the fact. What happens? Your thoughts, Scott. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll second the seriousness of uh, the Russian warning. Um, and let's let's talk about what that means. Well, first of that, let's talk about what Ukraine could possibly hope to accomplish here. Um, the 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 best thing that could happen for Ukraine is that they uh, they cause a major diversion of Russian resources to deal with this uh, with this issue, and 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 that's actually very attractive right now. If I were Ukrainian, I'd say, yeah, boss, that's a uh, this is something we probably need to do to uh, to get the Russians to shift resources away from what they're doing right now, which is basically kicking our butt, um, and and compel them to act because it is part of Russia, and Russia is going to be compelled to uh, to to respond to this. Russia can't ignore this. Um, so there's the plus. The minus: U Ukraine will never get to fire a single shell that's in that arsenal. Um, there, I mean, this will get blown in place before the Ukrainians are able to, uh, to, to, 
you know, seize control of this. So this can't be done to, you know, as a source of ammunition. So I, I take that off the table. Two, <clears throat> now I come in and say, hey, boss, let's also talk about the negatives. Because um, the first thing that's going to happen is that you're going to die. Um, Zelensky right now has been given a free pass uh, because Russia views this as a special military operation and assurances were given early on that, um, you know, th that they aren't going to take out uh, Ukrainian leadership targets. They've been threatened it all along. They say, if this happens, we can hit uh, leadership tar targets. We can hit decision-making centers. If this was a war, I'm just telling you right now, the very first target of the day would have been Zelensky. The second target would have been Zeluzhny. And these would have continued to be hit until they're dead or neutralized. You take out command and control. Um, and that hasn't been done, which is proof positive that we aren't at war. If Ukraine attacks Russia, which this would be, then Russia will be at war with Ukraine. And then the other thing that's going to happen, and I would tell uh, Zelensky is, hey, you know all that sort of free pass we've been given in terms of getting stuff across the border? You know, they come in on trains and they come in on highways, and then they're able to move, you know, from the west to the east relatively unscathed. That's over, too, because now Russia is going to be at war and they're going to take out every train line, every road line. They're going to take everything out. We will be cut off from the West. You're going to be dead. And uh, we're still not going to win because, uh, as Andre said, there's 6,000 well-trained, well-equipped Russian troops backed up by maybe up to another 10,000 uh, uh, Transnistrian uh, militia who are fighting on their home turf. Um, and it's not as though they've never prepared for this. They, they have a plan in place. There's only 25,000 Ukrainian troops. Um, that's just not enough. Um, and, and so I, I just don't see this happening. I, I think what could be happening is that Ukraine might um, be doing to Russia what Russia does to Ukraine, for instance, by having a group of forces in Belarus, by freezing Russia in place, uh, not not the 6,000 troops in Transnistria, they're frozen. But by threatening Transnistria, uh, Russia will have to set aside contingency forces uh, that cannot be used in, in other things. So this is a free one for Ukraine. By setting aside 25,000 reserves who can, at a moment's notice, be repositioned uh, to, to other parts, they're probably going to freeze in place you know, 50,000 Russian troops and a significant amount of uh, Russian, um, you know, air power missiles, things that could be otherwise used for this conflict. So it's a uh, it's a force multiplier. I think that's what's going on um, because this would literally be. I mean, Zelensky has to know he would die almost instantly if they attacked uh, Transnistria. He he, it's over for him. It's over for Zeluzhny. It's over for Ukrainian command and control. Um, it's over for the parliament. So. I um, I just can't see Zelensky committing suicide because there's literally nothing to be gained. This will be a loss for Ukraine. Ukraine can't win um, in this. Now, that doesn't mean they're not going to do something stupid because desperate people do desperate things. But I believe that um, if, look, if, you know, Z Zelensky relies upon MI6 and CIA uh, support. Uh, they advise him. And I can't imagine um, an MI6 or CIA person saying, a good thing to do, boss. I think they're all going to say, let us know before you do it because we're out of here. Uh, we don't want to be anywhere near, near you physically because you are literally dead man walking. Uh, did you have anything else to add to that, uh, Andre, as to what you know their reaction would be? And I would add this. All this um, members of the EU traipsing in and out of Kiev every other week ain't going to happen. Any but anyway, <laughs> your thoughts, Andrew, Andre? Um, Scott, absolutely a, a spot on here when he makes this extraordinarily important distinction between the special military operation and war. And the war, even by the documents of the general staff and central apparatus of the Ministry of Defense, is prosecuted a little bit differently than special military operation because it involves completely different coefficients, operational coefficients in terms of, for example, civilian uh, uh, casualties. Sounds horrible, but guess what? If you fight a war, there is a much wider margin which is allowed to your units to have in terms of the civilian casualties. It sounds horrible, I know. I am I'm a peaceful man, you know, I hate war, you know. 
but the point is that that thing comes and Scott absolutely correctly stated there are a number of kinjals uh, and 3M14 calibers with the personal names on it of Mr. Zelensky, Zaluzhny, and uh, uh, what's uh, uh, the name of it, the Ukrainian uh, Rada, and things of this nature. And they will be delivered. The targeting is known. You know, it's there. They know, you know, those are fixed targets. Everybody knows where those bunkers are. They saw what Kinjal does at the bunker of the Soviet time at the depth of 60 plus meters. So it, there's no way they can hide. And uh, so in this case, are they uh, capable of doing stupid things? No. Yes, they are. Will they? Uh, it's a brilliant notion that, yeah, the CIA and MI6 guys will ask first, you know, what? Let that, let us, you know, escape first and then you know, do whatever you want to do. You know, so um, that's what it is. Next, I want to go to something else that I think is important, and that is Poland. You know, what we keep hearing is, that, you know, Poland's got 125, 150, however many thousands of troops. They're building more. They're heading in. My first thought is, yeah, but they've given up a lot of their stuff. And so they're going to be short. Um we know they've given up a lot of their ammunition, so they're not in a... Look, if um, Ukraine's running out of ammo, they sure don't have ammo to get in, give into Poland, so Poland can't get in there and fight for a long time, so they'll be out of ammo. The people who are concerned about Poland coming into Western, storming into Western Ukraine and, you know, making a move there. Your thoughts on that, Scott? Well, I mean, uh, let me let me draw on the words of... Um... Uh, General Savoli, uh, I might be saying his name wrong. He's the uh, the American uh, commander of forces, Kaboli, I think it is, um, three-star general. Um, he's also the commander of uh, NATO ground forces. Um, he spoke in Sweden last month, and um, he said some very interesting things. He said that the scope and scale of the violence taking place in eastern Ukraine today is beyond the imagination of NATO, that NATO never could have imagined this kind of fighting. Um, and that's interesting because if NATO couldn't imagine it, that means NATO isn't organized for it, trained for it, equipped for it. Um, NATO can't fight that. Now, who's a part of NATO? Poland. So right off the bat, if, if the, if an American general is saying, Hey, my American brigades aren't ready for this. they they haven't imagined this. We, we don't have the ammunition to do this. We don't have the logistics sustainability. We don't have the operational methodology. We don't have anything to do this. Um, the Poles definitely don't. They're not a good military. They're an okay military from a peacetime European standpoint. But this is not a military that can immediately transition to what's going on in eastern Ukraine. They would all die pretty soon. Now we take that. And we understand that they've been transitioning their tanks over there. So a lot of their armor reserve is depleted, gone. They've been providing their artillery over there. That's gone. The ammunition is gone. So the Polish military, even before they transitioned stuff over to Ukraine, couldn't fight this war. It's not big enough, first of all. 165,000 troops sounds good on paper, but that isn't 165 combat troops. All right. That might mean that they have less than 50% of that is being combat troops. So let's say 60, 70,000 uh, could fight a war, but they can't fight a war because they haven't imagined it. Uh, so they're not prepared for it. So Poland's out of the picture. Now they're talking about beefing up the 300,000. A, that doesn't happen overnight. B, I don't think Poland's going to be able to pull that thing off. Um, the Polish people aren't ready. The Polish military, 10,000 Polish uh, officers and men have left the military instead of re-enlisting because they say, we don't want to have anything to do with this. So, you know, that's, I, I don't think the Polish military is in a position to do anything. And I, I, well, I have a little concern about Polish politicians being deficient. Yeah. Um, I don't have a concern about the Polish military. They are professional officers who aren't suicidal. And when given the thing about professional military officers is they will give you an honest assessment of the task. I have yet to meet a professional officer who says, uh, looking at a plan going, knowing that he doesn't have the forces to do it, going, oh, we got this one, boss. We got this one. No, almost always they say, no, nah, no, nah, uh, we don't have the forces, the structure. My men can't do that. We haven't trained for this. This is insanity. Uh, I don't think it's a good idea. And I think there's Polish officers saying it, which is why 
this conflict has become politicized with this Polish legion uh, now that they're talking about taking former military people, turning them into a Polish legion that will then be turned over to the um, to the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense. But here's where it gets tricky because that Polish legion may not have a Polish military component, meaning the Department of Defense is detached, but it definitely has a Polish security service standard. And this is where, or linkage, and this is where it gets tricky because now people might think if we can get 20,000 legionnaires over there, um, we have them in place where we can make a move on Western Ukraine at a moment's notice. And this is something that intelligence services might think is an attractive idea. But again, a, a professional military guy go, will say, uh, you do know that they're all going to die because the Russians aren't going to tolerate this and they will come in with this major force and they will be backed up by hundreds of thousands of Belarusians. Um, and who will swamp anything we've got in Western Ukraine. So I think the Poles right now are doing a lot of talking, but I think there's realists in the Polish military, uh, and hopefully in the government, that realize they don't want to get tangled up in Western Ukraine. You know, Andre, let me add this. I know I've talked to people from Poland, and the Polish people are not nearly as... Um, supportive of this as we're led to believe that in in the West that the Polish, sure, they've got these crazy people running the government, but the Polish people are very, very reticent about this. At any rate, your thoughts on, you know, you got this Belarusian contingent up there. As, uh, your thoughts on Poland? Um, I am on the record from the start. If Polish politicians, I specifically make distinction, and uh, uh, Scott and you correctly stated that uh, there is a dramatic difference between, in, in terms of intensity of Russophobia uh, in Poland between the political elite and Polish people. They are much more kind of tame, you know, in this respect. Um, I'm on the record that um, we do not have uh, any more political uh, elite in Poland, which if it would have been behaving itself properly, less hostile and less Russophobic, that Russia would probably acquiesce to their desire, actually, you know, to take what they call Kresy, which are Western Ukrainian, which are historically Polish territories. And don't forget, uh, Lvov, or Lviv, it's a Polish city which was used to, to be called Lemberg. So, and but they actually basically blew the chance, you know, with Russians, with Kremlin. And instead of saying, hey guys, you know, like let's hush it over, you know, and then let us kind of, you know, introduce things there and kind of, you know, Russia doesn't need Western Ukraine, Russia doesn't want Western Ukraine. You know, and that's the problem. But then there is another thing. I spoke yesterday, for example, with uh, my friends from Russia, including people who are basically real professional military reporters and who are on the front lines periodically all the time, almost, you know, uh, since the start of the operation. We should not forget that all those, that mobilization, with all those 300 plus, I believe 318,000, which have been mobilized, all those reservists, they are not in, uh, how to put it, recruits. Those are people which already served in the armed forces and they have their what is called, uh, uh, I don't remember the American terms for this, but it's called military uh, registration specialty. That means people that are tankers, you know, they are, you know, artillery operators and things like that. Uh, they are still not uh, fully introduced there at all. They are just a very small number of the units being introduced into the combat frontline units. Majority of these 300,000 is still primarily in the second echelon, if not rear training. We can only speculate what for, but... The point is that uh, first, their what is called the course of their um, LDNR, I mean uh, Lugansk and uh, Donetsk militias, they're not course or militias anymore. They are official regular divisions of Russia, and we are talking about uh, ten to twelve regiment divisions. Real deal now. There is a huge influx in the last uh, two months of the the modern, most modern equipment. And of course, the thing which many people forget, one of the reasons it is possible, and everybody talks about Wagner Group, for example, but nobody talks about the fact that Russians volunteer in huge numbers 
And those volunteers, not those people who have been, you know, called through mobilization. We are talking about tens upon tens of thousands who come to the military commissariats every day and say, hey, I'm like, you know, 40 years old or 35 years old. I used to serve, you know, I've been here and there. I was in Chechnya. I was here and there. Uh, send me somewhere. And those people, they form units, formations out of them, and they fight. So, and in this particular case, we are talking that majority of the forces on the Russian side ha haven't been em employed yet. Which let's let's jump right into it then. Bakhmut, you know, I'm looking all over and I'm and I'm looking at a number of the um, the maps. And if I were Ukrainian, I wouldn't want to be in Bakhmut right now. It it looks yeah. like the cauldron or whatever you want to call it is closing, and the it really looks like the Russians now have at minimum fire control over all entrances. That there's going to be tens of thousands of. Ukrainian soldiers that are going to either they're going to put their T-shirts on a white flag on a, on a you know on a mop handle and hold up a white flag, or they're all going to perish. Bakhmut, what's happening there um, you, from your 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 understanding, Scott Ritter? Well, I mean, <clears throat> when you look at the uh, maps, uh, there's a, a, a an entity called Rybar that uh, puts out some pretty cool looking maps. Um, I, I I I look at those. I look at other maps. Um, you know, I'm a prisoner to data that I don't control. So, you know, I, I can only look at things. I, you know, I'm not somebody who gets to call up satellite imagery and uh, take SIGINT data and link the two and say, this is exactly what's going on. So, you know, I, I look at it and I take everything with a grain of salt. But um, what I'll say is Bakhmut has a tremendous grouping of blue, meaning the little unit icons that they put in there to represent different units. There's a lot of blue in the Bakhmut area. And then as you leave Bakhmut, it sort of thins out. Um, that tells me that the Ukrainians have made a decision that they're going to. Now, Bakhmut has been part of the Bakhmut Solodar uh, fortress uh, that has been prepared for over eight years um, for this very kind of uh, thing. And, you know, this is a battle that's been going on since May. It's not like Bakhmut just happened. This is an ongoing battle, and it's been a constant Russian offensive. Russia's never stopped attacking in this area, and Ukraine's never stopped defending in this area. This has been a meat grinder from day one. Uh, Prigozhin, who's not prone to exaggeration, uh, he's he's a narcissist. He's a you know I'm I'm Mr. Wagner. I'm great, but he's been pretty honest about the fighting. And um, when he says that Wagner alone has killed 110,000 Ukrainians, I believe him. Uh, the fighting that has been been taking place in Bakhmut's Solodar area has been unreal fighting. It also means that Wagner's lost a lot of people too. I don't think, I think that's an underappreciated uh, fact. Uh, Wagner is a very, um, uh, you know, offensive oriented organization, aggressive offensive operations supported by sufficient um, fire support, but still uh, they're taking casualties too. This has been bloody, bloody fighting. Why? Why would uh, Ukraine do this? First of all, because it's some of the most defensible uh, uh, territory. Second of all, it's close to Donetsk. It's close to the, the, you know, the center of the fighting. This has been the anchor of the Ukrainian position. Um, and so, and it's now taken on, at least I believe, Andre, you can correct me if I'm wrong, because I fully admit I could be wrong on this one, uh, because I'm a historian, so sometimes I I'm readily looking for historical analogies. I am in the uh, same position as you are. I sometimes grab something extra, but yeah, we live uh, what we can I'm, get from. I'm calling this. I'm calling this the Ukrainian Stalingrad. And the reason why I say that is that, like the Germans who poured resources into Stalingrad that shouldn't have been there, the city just wasn't worth it. Um, but the Sixth Army was there. They poured in the Fourth Tank Army. They poured in everything instead of defending their flanks. They poured it in there, and um, then they they ended up losing it all. Ukraine has committed some of their most elite forces into the Bakhmut fighting. Now, I'm somebody who also believes that um, the 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 reporting of a cauldron um, is exaggerated, meaning that Ukrainians aren't stupid; they're not suicidal. Um, and there's indications that Zelensky has come to the realization that the battle's over. 
Uh, and so they're trying to mitigate their losses. So some of these units may be pulling out. So the notion that the entire Ukrainian army is going to be captured in Bakhmut, I think, is exaggerated. But it doesn't matter because the units that they're pulling out are going to be pulled out without their heavy equipment, um, having suffered sufficient losses and not readily transferable to other parts of the battlefield. They're going to have to go out and regroup. They're shell-shocked. They are um, you know, defeated. Um, and so this, this is, has the potential to be one of the more decisive battles of this whole effort. I personally believe that the Russian offensive has already begun. I agree with Andre that the Russians haven't committed uh, a significant part. And I also agree that there are specific breakthrough units, we'll call them, um, which are you know equipped with, I don't know, that T-90 breakthrough tank um, and the Terminator and other things. They're still training. I mean, it's uh, people don't understand that there are still combat units. And, and I think Andre also hinted on something that maybe people don't understand. When Russia started this campaign, this special military operation, their military was organized into what they called uh, the battalion tactical groups, um, which was the peacetime organization of, of this because it dates back to a decision that was made in the 1990s to go away from big Soviet era uh, formations and to go into smaller things because nobody anticipated large scale ground combat. Everybody anticipated localized combat like Chechnya, maybe something uh, akin to what happened in Kosovo, etc. cetera. Um, they aren't doing the battalion tactic group anymore. Uh, part of the things that's happened in this pause is that the Russians have reorganized back into regiments, back into divisions, back into corps and armies. Um, yeah. because they're not playing the little game anymore. They're playing the big game. And the big game's in play, I believe. Uh, I believe that, you know, while the focus is on Bakhmut, Bakhmut is a giant sump. Uh, that, that the reason why, one of the reasons why the Russians continue to do that is the Ukrainians continue to deploy forces. Yeah. So if your job is to kill Ukrainians, the business of killing Ukrainians is better, nowhere better than Bakhmut. Yeah. Good so boy, yeah. fight, hold, bring them in. But meanwhile, in Zaporizhia and Ulidar and uh, Limon and another area, the Russians are pressing forward, in some cases, making impressive gains. Five yeah. kilometers here, seven kilometers there. Sometimes they're – look, you can look at Telegram. It's problematic to do that. But you can look at Telegram and you can see the videos every once in a while of destroyed Russian equipment and all that. Hey, guys, it's called war for a reason. Um is everything going to go perfect for the Russians? Uh, are you telling me that a Russian reconnaissance and force using a company, a reinforced company, isn't going to run into a minefield, get hit by prepared artillery fires, and suffer losses? That's going to happen all the time. It's called war. That's why they do a reconnaissance force. But what you're not seeing is when that happens, Russian counter battery fires taking out the Ukrainian forces, and the Russians then identifying weaknesses. The Ukrainians have committed here. They press here. And next thing you know, that position's outflanked, and they've moved forward. Yeah, there's some destroyed Russian equipment, but that's called war. Nothing's perfect. Take a look at everything we did, you know, the United States. Look at our offensive. Look at Operation Cobra and the breakout of the uh, uh, of the hedgehog positions in yeah. Normandy, and you're going to see a lot of yeah. destroyed American tanks, a lot of destroyed British tanks, a lot of dead guys, uh, because you have to shape the battlefield. And part of shaping the battlefield is throwing punches and getting yeah. punched and committing people to fight. But then because you have superiority of forces, superior of organizational structure, you're able to identify gaps, push through. And this is what I believe is happening right now across the whole breadth of the front. The offensive has begun. People are expecting big arrow stuff. This is about grinding them down. This is about uh, shaping the battlefield. There will be a time for big arrow, but the Russians aren't going to do big arrow while the Ukrainians have the ability to put a medium arrow into the base of the big arrow, cut it off and kill it. Um, you know, st again, study maneuver warfare in World War II. You know, the Russians and the Germans in Kharkov in 1943, 1944, the back and forth, the back and forth. A lot of guys died. Russia doesn't want that. Russia is pushing for the destruction of Army Group Center. Again, Andre, forgive me for my historical analogies, but they're looking, <laughs> for, the, they're looking for the collapse of the Ukrainian forces and then the pursuit. And guess who's going to be pursuing? All the screaming memes right now that are getting trained up, <laughs> finalizing their training, they're sitting there, <clears throat> and I'll leave it with this. And again, Andre, 
correct me if I'm wrong, because I no, I'm, you're, you're on wrong here. I'm, I'm an American and sometimes I allow my uh, American analogies to get out of hand. But I oh, liken the mobilization of the 300,000 Russian reservists to what happened in World War II uh, with the mobilization of an American draftee army. Now, it's an incomplete thing uh, it, it, because the Russians are experienced. But what happened to the Americans, and again, Rick Atkinson wrote a brilliant trilogy, um, and he goes to the Army of Dawn, you know, and then I, I forget what the middle book uh, is called, and then, then the guns last battle. Or, but when you get to the second volume, you see the transition of this happy-go-lucky draftee army that didn't want to be there. If everybody thinks that World War II is about American patriotism and extreme, the vast majority of those draftees would have preferred to be home. They didn't volunteer for this. They were forced to do this, and now they're doing it, and they don't want to be there. These aren't elite troops, all this stuff. But then they get thrown into the cauldron of fire, and they quickly realize a couple things. One, that they could die, and they are dying, and that the best way to stop dying is to kill the bad guys before they kill you. And so they get hardened. Then they also realize that they're not contract soldiers. They don't get to go home in five months, six months. This isn't the American Civil War where you signed a draft, you know, a, a, an agreement, and when your term ended, you went home. They're in for the duration. So the quickest way to get home is to go through the enemy and take Berlin. And they became the most hardened killers in the world, not because they wanted to be, they had no choice. Now, I look at these 300,000, and I'm looking at Russian men that don't want to be there. Yeah. Oh, they're going because they're – but trust me, if they had a choice, they already served. They want to be home with mama. They want to be in bed with their wife. They want to be playing with their children or their grandchildren because, as Andre said, some of these guys are getting a little long in the tooth and gray in the hair. But they're there doing the job because they've been called up, and they know the only way they get to go home to mama – is through the Ukrainians. So these aren't guys who are, uh, excuse my language, half ass in it. These are guys that are saying, we're going to get the job done. I think there's a Russia, yeah, uh, we're working, we're on the job. And that's their term, man. They're at work and they're going to do the work, do the job. And I feel sorry for the Ukrainians that are going to face them because these that's they're okay. facing professional warriors who are committed to a fight, not because of ideology. I do believe that they view this as a second patri patriotic right. war, but I don't think that's what's motivated them. What's motivated them is to get home. Well, we're to get home. home. The only way to get home is to go through the Ukrainians, and God help the Ukrainians understand in front of these guys, because they're going to die. Andre, you know, we always talk about the concept of the cauldron. You mm -hmm. understand that concept. You know the history of that. Talk about Bakhmut, what's going on there, your thoughts on how that fits in to, as, what, as Scott was saying, the overall plan, what's going on in the contact line, but start with Bakhmut. Uh, Scott made an incredibly uh, accurate uh, reference, actually, and it's an American one. It's about Cobra. It's a breakout from Normandy. And then, of course, organization, so to speak, the, of the Falaise uh, pocket, as they called it. Uh, Bradley, Amar Bradley, it wasn't Patton, you know? It wasn't his level, even, of understanding all the warfare. It was truly capable and talented Mr. Amar Bradley who developed this plan. And it's uh, actually recorded that when the um, uh, allies started to bomb, uh, the, basically, the, the sector where they had to break out, he went there, obviously, he was near, went almost to the front line because he didn't have to go immediately there. And then he comes back, he reports to Eisenhower and he reported. It was as, as bad as anything on the Eastern Front. You know, so they're showing this. And of course, then we know the situation, the breakout happens, the Third Army gets unleashed and, you know, they trap this number of the uh, uh, Wehrmacht people there. Here, it's... Uh, Practically the same thing, but another matter that we have to hear, we have to tweak a little bit about this cauldron around Bakhmut because, uh, and here comes this thing which, and you can quote me on that. Those people who are 
advise uh, Zelensky and Zaluzhny, and of course we understand it is CIA, it is MI6, it is Pentagon, which is obviously helping them in terms the, of the operational planning. Pentagon has an excellent computer system. They can game it, you know, uh, as well as Russian general stuff. So, and they game it constantly. But the point is, initially, they thought that they will basically bleed Russia they're white, you know, because, of course, there was a, uh, it's Solidar, yeah, it is Solidar Bakhmut uh, uh, Festung, so to speak, you know, uh, the um, uh, fortress. But, of course, they miscalculated. And now what happens? They gave it prematurely so much significance that now it's too late to go back, although they're already trying to say, ah, it's not that significant, it's not really that important, but it is important. It is important politically because obviously, starting from tactical level up to operational strategic, it becomes political because war is a political act, first and foremost, you know. But what happens in Bakhmut, the first sign that things are really bad there, you know what, yesterday, Zaluzhny and Armed Forces of Ukraine, Ministry of Defense of Ukraine, comes up and says, oh, we have about two and a half thousand people left in Bakhmut. Really? <laughs> okay, that means what? They are playing down immediately what is coming. And then, of course, our Russian Defense Ministry and people who in the north say, no, 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 it's not 2,500 there. Uh, more like 25,000 there, you know, and this will be their prisoners of war. And then, of course, there are confirmed report, horrifying report. Wagner, because Wagner is the main storm group in Bakhmut area, they have now number of the special teams because they say their corpses sometimes lay not just one way, it's just two, la two layers, basically, of corpses of all over the battlefield. And they have to collect them because, obviously, it's a little bit on the warm side now. And um, they begin to decompose, obviously. And this is the, obviously, issue of the hygiene. It's the issue of the infections. It's the issue of the horrible smell, which is already there. So they gather them every day, you know, hundreds upon hundreds, sometimes thousands. It's just horrifying what is going there. Literally a meat grinder. And now here's the thing. Everybody were thinking, me, me included, everybody. Uh, and I remember me talking about it. Everybody talks. Douglas McGregor talks. I believe Scott, you spoke too about it. Ah, okay. The uh, land freezes, you know, and, you know, the movement starts. It, this, it did start because the land froze at some point of time. But now it's a kind of this, uh, what is called Rasputitsa, uh, it's a famous uh, term, which is basically a mix of the, you know, slash, you know, and things of this nature. And it's not easy to get, a, a, a move anything of the ser serious weight in terms of the tanks and APCs. But guess what? It also impedes dramatically. In fact, it's uh, crucially the evacuation uh, effort uh, of the armed forces from Bakhmut. That is why, the, for example, the, uh, the way th those uh, wounded are not treated as horrifying. People are dying in a complete agony. And uh, I mean, listen, uh, I'm not bloodthirsty man, you know. I understand many of those people have been forced to go there. But plus also reports that majority now of the corpses with the IDs on them, they are from the West Ukraine. Basically, Eastern Ukraine simply ran out of the mobilization material. And uh, you know what? They they hated Russia. They went, many of them went, volunteered, volunteered to go there. And so at this stage, we're talking about the operational uh, envelopment of Bakhmut, meaning what? The last uh, road, which actually they can use, is controlled by fire means of Russia. And... Probably tomorrow, after tomorrow, I don't know, we might be talking about the tactical, uh, uh, you know, envelopment when there will be physical closing, and then we'll see what happens. But as Scott correctly stated, we constantly forget that uh, the front itself, the length of the front is more than 1,000 kilometers. People forgot when I remember when a few months ago, when Russians totally deliberately left Kupiansk, 
and Krasny Liman, Red Liman, and withdrew because why would you kill your 600 sober guys, you know, which is the mil uh, uh, military police type people, you know, uh, heavy police, uh, when you can withdraw from this town, which you don't need really. Now, guess what? Russia is coming back. And this, uh, you know, if euphoria which they had at that time that, oh, my God, we took like 2,000 square kilometers. Well, guess what? They already gave them up. <laughs> so it's like, what can I say? And uh, Bakhmut is just one of those places. The whole front now now in motion. And as Scott and other people correctly use this wonderful term, will we see uh, those big arrows soon and exploitation? Possible. Very possible. How probable? I I would say very probable. Fairly soon. Uh, Scott. Okay, then that brings the question: What next, Odessa? Seeing what's going on in Transnistria makes me think it's more probable now. You know, there was a the, the discussion was: Well, will the Russians say, okay, we'll use um, Odessa as a um, a bargaining chip? that at some point we'll say to the West, hey, you make a deal with us or we go to Odessa. Well, it doesn't seem to me that the Russians trust the, the Americans enough to make a deal with them anyway. And they're making noise in Transnistria. It seems to me, my thought is, at some point, I'm not going to say they're going to go blow Odessa up. I think there is certainly, you know, a historical love for Odessa. That's they don't they don't want to mess it up. And but I can see architecturally, architecturally, yes. Odessa is marvel. It's yes. such a beautiful city. You just don't want to kill it. Yeah, right. And there's the whole connection with Greece there and all of that. Um, Scott, what happens? Because uh, let me add this: because Bakhmut, Solidar Falls. I think the the Donbass wars is 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 is. is Technically, you know, theoretically, it's resolved. There's nothing between them and the Dnieper River. Do they go, do they make a move on Kiev? Do they make a move on Odessa? Things of that nature. What what what, what happens next? Well, first of all, I think there's a whole lot of heavy fighting left in, in Donbass. Yeah. Uh, Donetsk is, uh, the Donetsk Republic is still, I mean, after Bakhmut, you know, there's high ground uh, west of Bakhmut that uh, has, uh, uh, the, the Ukrainians are already fortifying. Um, you you have um, the uh, gosh I'm gonna Kramatorsk is that the city yeah, Kramatorsk uh, yes yes yeah. yes um, you know that ain't fallen yet either and there's the defenses around that um, <clears throat> so anybody who thinks that you know the fall of Bakhmut means the Russians have won the war uh, not even close it just means that uh, they've won a very big psychological battle that is part of the overall collapsing of Ukrainian morale but um, <clears throat> we got to hand it to the Ukrainians. Um, you know, they fight and they fight well. Uh, I've said this, uh, and, and again, Andre, I'm an American who's prone to some exaggeration sometimes, but um, I have such little regard for NATO um, and their combat capability. <clears throat> I believe that if uh, there was a ceasefire in Ukraine, uh, organized its troops uh, and pivoted uh, to the West, that they could defeat any NATO <laughs> military formation there is because they know how to fight. They're good <laughs> warriors. Um, and they know what war is, and NATO has no clue. As General Kaboli said, NATO can't even imagine what the Ukrainians have gone through. Uh, the Ukrainians are that good, which tells you something about the Russians. I know there's a lot of people out there that are denigrating the Russians. They're bad. They're this. They're that. Did Russia make mistakes? Yeah. Did, uh, Russia learn from yeah. Their mistakes? Yes. And uh, is Russia going to make more mistakes? Probably. Will they learn from those mistakes? Yes. That's called war. <laughs> No plan survives initial contact initial, with the enemy. Yeah. And so, you know, you think you got your act together, you come in, the enemy has a vote. That's another saying. Uh, yeah, so the most democratic affair something. is war. Yeah, <laughs> enemy yeah. always has the say. Yeah. Got, I got a vote, and something their vote is pretty significant. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's like, oops, we just got beat. Uh, but that's okay. You adjust, you adapt, you regroup, and then you, you go forward again. There's going to be a lot of fighting left. Uh, nobody should ever think that this is going to be easy or quick. Um, so right then, I think that the number one priority for the for the Russians is to secure um, Donetsk. Um, and remember, that includes uh, Kramatorsk. Uh, that's a that's oh, yeah. part of Kramatorsk. Donetsk. They, yeah, that's... Yeah. They, so they've Donetsk. got a lot of fighting ahead of them to, to do. And to support that battle, I believe the major offensive support will come from the north. 
uh, from the Kharkov area uh, because they have to protect that flank. And so this is going to be the focus of effort. Uh, Zaporizhia will be a supporting attack, but you know, sometimes supporting attacks become the major attack when they succeed. It's yeah, amazing well, how that happens in the military. Yes. You know, you're sitting there going, main effort coming down from the north. Uh, Ukrainians are sort of holding us here, guys. It's not working. Oh, God, they just launched a counterattack. We lost 20 kilometers. Uh, look at Zaporizhia. We're moving forward. Hey, boys, freeze, reserves, exploit. Yeah. You never know how war turns out. But I think the primary effort is going to be securing the, um, the, the Donbass. And securing the Donbass means not just the territory, but remember, I mean, you guys know Ray McGovern. I mm -hmm. love Ray McGovern, uh, CIA analyst, former Soviet hand. Um, and he, I, I, it might have been on your show, Garland, where he, uh, he educated me. I, you know, because I'm a, I'm, I'm, I, I like, I'm getting old now. So I call myself an old Soviet hand because I'm actually one of the guys that actually did intelligence analysis during the Soviet times. So I can say I was an old Soviet hand. Ray was the original. He's the original <laughs> gangster of old Soviet hands. Uh, so, you know, Ray's like, sure thing, little puppy. Hey, grasshopper, <laughs> you know, calm down. Um, but he, he said some interesting things. Um, you talked about criminology. And, uh, you know, that's the old arcane art that was popular in the later part of the Brezhnev years and then Andropov and uh, uh, Chernyenko, where you just wanted to know what was going on in the Politburo. And so we looked at parades and who's standing next to whom and who's wearing the right watch and who has a scarf on, who has a hat on, who, you know, is sneezing, who's looking, who's staring. And everybody would write up these ridiculous reports. I didn't write them up, but I would read them going, are people really doing this? Well, you know who wasn't doing that? Ray McGovern. Why? Because he's a pro. Ray McGovern used a tool called the Foreign Broadcast Information Service. Uh, it was a CIA group that translated all the speeches, all the newspapers, all the radio broadcasts, all the tele, and put it in a nice unclassified, they had a classified annex for some of this stuff, but unclassified uh, thing that they publish on a daily basis. I used to subscribe to it. You'd get it, big chunk of stuff, and you read it, and what was interesting is the bad analysts would say, that's just Russian propaganda. Don't read that. That's Russian propaganda. Poison your mind. Uh, but Ray went, you know, they have a tendency to say what they mean and mean what they say. Um, and so why don't we listen to what they say? They might tell us a couple things. And Ray was 100% correct. The best intelligence came from simply reading what Soviet leaders said, especially in the local papers, because... Is, is bad as, I mean, you know, you can say it wasn't perfect, but they didn't lie. They didn't lie to themselves. They told the you truth. Know, to let, themselves. Let, me make, let me make a and, comment on that. Yeah. You know, I work with Russians daily and I, I tell people, I understand the Russian culture. And, you know, my mentor was Paul Robeson Jr., a man who went to school in the Soviet Union. And me and his father were very, you know, they knew Russia. And I say, I understand the Russian culture. And, and I, that's something I will say. Listen to what the Russians say. They are very, very straightforward. They are very clear. And when they say X, they mean all this business about Russiagate, they're trying to, you know, foment discord. That ain't the Russian culture. If the Russian says, if you do this, I'll punch you in the nose. If you do it, you gonna punch he's in the nose. Go to punch in the nose. <laughs> well, Andre, you're. Well, well let me just add one thing. Good. Who's the number one Russian? Because there's a reason why I brought this up. <laughs> Vladimir Putin. The number one Russian is Vladimir Putin. And Vladimir Putin just gave a speech on February 21st. And it's been discounted in the West. It's just propaganda. Propaganda. Don't listen to it. It's boring. He didn't say. He said everything. Garland, you asked about Odessa. What Vladimir Putin said is, we will be compelled. He said, first of all, he said, our number one objective in the, in the special military operation is the restoration of the economic and social life for Nova Russia and Donbass. No, number one objective. Number one objective. Everybody's like, is he going to take Odessa? Is he going to take Kharkov? Is he going to take Kiev? Putin just told you what he's doing. We're restoring the social and economic life of Nova Russia and Donbass. Nova Russia defined as Zaporizhia and Kherson. Now, but then he said something very interesting. Because of the Western armaments that have been provided, we will be, we have to push the Ukrainians back from that border to the distance dictated by the weaponry provided. That used to be the range of the M777 howitzer, 40 clicks. Then they got HIMARS. So now the Russians are going to have to push you back 
85 kilometers. And now we've given them the upgraded HIMARS, the small bomb missile. That's 150 kilometers. You asked about um, Odessa Garland. Here's an exercise that needs to happen. Take a map, take a compass, go to the scale and put it down and measure the scale 150 kilometers. Now go to Kherson's border, not, not the one that it is, the whole Kherson, the right bank. Put the needle in the border and draw an arc of 150 kilometers and tell me what falls inside that. And the answer is everything. Odessa, <laughs> Kharkov. So Vladimir Putin just told you what's going to happen. See, when I talked about the Odessa moment prior to that, it was before the provision of these long range systems, before uh, this, uh, you know, and I believed at that time that Russia might pause for what I called the Odessa moment where they said, do we want to go? Do we want to give them a chance? That's done. The Odessa moment ain't going to happen um, because things have changed. And one of the things that have changed is that the West continues to provide weaponry that threatens the economic and social reconstitution of Novorossi and Donbass. Number one priority. To secure that, you must push forward. Now, let me give you the last thing, and Andre, I'll turn it over to you. If Russia takes Odessa, they're never giving it back. If Russia takes Odessa, yeah. they're going all the way to Transnistria. They're cutting off the Black yeah. Sea coast. That's a land, so this, land bridge, yes. This is going yeah. to happen because yeah. Russia's already said, we're taking Odessa. If they take Kharkov, they may have to take Sumy. And if they take Kharkov, they're never giving it back. And if they take Sumy, they're never giving it back. I don't know what the future is going to be for Nepopetrovsk, but I would imagine that it might, too, become a Russian city because when you take that compass – and you put the yeah. needle on the border and you draw the 150 kilometer circle, that falls into it too. Ukraine and NATO literally slit the throat of Ukraine. They've killed themselves. They've self immolated. They've committed suicide. And Vladimir Putin, everybody's going, we're waiting for Vladimir Putin to, to tell us something. He did, guys. He told you everything. You're just not listening. Andre, and I'll add this. From the very beginning, I always kept wondering, why don't they bomb the bridge across the big, what is that, the big river, the Dnieper River, the big one in the, that runs across the middle of Ukraine? Uh, no, they are uh, uh, across, uh, in Kherson, the Antonovsky Bridge, they blew it up. Okay. Uh, so now here comes the other thing, which uh, Scott correctly pointed out, absolutely. You take the compass and you draw the ranges, you know, and then you see for yourself. If you look at 1944 uh, operations by Talbuchin and other uh, fronts which were, uh, uh, of the Red Army, which were freeing uh, Nikolaev and Odessa, you will see a very interesting pattern. If you look at the shoreline, starting from Kherson, of, uh, uh, which leads to, of the Black Sea, which leads towards Odessa, you will see that those long... Not rivers, they called limans, limans, you know, there's a long, long uh, intrusions of sea, sometimes up to 30 kilometers. And in order for you to go from Kherson, that is why Kherson was given up uh, to take uh, Nikolaev and Odessa, you need to constantly cross and force, you know, those limans. Uh, who would do that? It's just, you know, basically suicide. But if you look at those operations in 1944, what you'll see. They go out through Zaporozhye, Zaporizhye, well, Zaporozhye, you know, and then they turn strictly to the south along the lines of those Limans, you know. And guess what Russia is doing right now? This is precisely what Russia is doing right now. It is Kupiansk, it is Red Liman. On the north, you have those guys in Belarus sitting there, tying up all those forces around Kharkov and Kiev in order to secure the flank of the thing when we, it will begin to turn left. And that's what Scott correctly stated. There will be no most likely Odessa moment anymore. Odessa will be taken together with Nikolaev, you know. And this is what is happening now in a strategic sense. And many people don't understand that they think, oh, yeah, you know, like just Bakhmut alone. Not by Bakhmut alone. There's a lot of going on. And fact is, yes, on the north, north of Zaporozhye, and towards uh, Liman and Kupiansk and those places. Russia, yes, gaining ground tremendously, some five, seven kilometers a day sometimes, you know? So it's significant. You wouldn't, wouldn't read it, of course, uh, in uh, Western media. They do not like to report on those things. 
because they want to concentrate on those brilliant quote unquote ukrainian gains <laughs> in when what happened uh, end of summer early you know early september and they thought that uh, russians just left they never fought it you know and yeah odessa most likely and then land bridge to transnistria last thing i want to touch base with you guys with that i certainly appreciate you coming on and that is this issue one of the, the the discussions now is the you know certainly there's china there's russia and there's the there's an issue of um naval warfare mm -hmm. and the u.s certainly for years has um you know we've got a blue water navy you know we've yeah. got this navy that can you know, certainly a very very powerful um yeah. submarine force but they they project their force i would argue mainly through these um area uh, uh um aircraft carrier groups. yeah with the issue of the range and power of missiles now, it seems to me that in a real warfare, that's kind of outdated. That the ability to project your power through aircraft carrier groups and through surface naval ships, I, I don't see how you do that anymore with the power of missiles and the range of missiles. Well, we'll start with you, Andre, this time, uh, since you know the history of these missiles and what what are your thoughts on, on, on that? I'm writing the fourth book on that now. <laughs> so, um, uh, again, the, with the advent of the uh, very precise targeting, and Russia and the United States, they do have precise targeting. But in crossing into first supersonic and now hypersonic uh, uh, field, you cannot defend from hypersonic missiles. There's nothing you can do about it. And 3M22 Zircon, which is the newest uh, hypersonic missile, anti-shipping missile, it has official, official confirmed range of 1,500 kilometers. Something tells me that uh, it might be a little bit longer than that. So it is twice as uh, longer than the uh, what, uh, modern U.S. Naval, uh, U.S. Navy's uh, carrier battle group can touch, even with the Hawkeyes, you know, at the... Um, uh, furthest uh, rim, so to speak, of the uh, uh, intelligence and uh, radar uh, patrol. So in this case, yeah, it's over for the surface fleet as we used to know it. It is over. It's simple as that. Now, Mr. Shaigu is, I mean, he was blunt. He was almost boring. He said, we don't need new uh, aircraft carriers. We need the, the weapons which sink them. And the only thing which today remains, United States Navy has a superb world-class submarine force. That, yes, I'm talking about multi-purpose. I'm not talking about the strategic missile submarines. Here we have the situation with the U.S. Navy because it kind of stuck with this Columbia coming class. It's not pro proceeding as it was supposed to. But in terms of multi-purpose, fast attack submarines, United States is probably, arguably, the best submarine force in the world. China is not even the same league. Only second one are Russians. Uh, the rest of it is just really a not even observable on the horizon, you know. And and uh, I'll throw that, that at you, Scott. And here's the other thing: you, when you're talking about using the surface fleet, you're talking about protecting, projecting power. So if I'm Russia, you got to come to me. You have to come if you want to attack me. If that's the problem with projecting power, even with China, the U.S. has some advantages, certainly. But they got to go 6,000 miles across the ocean. They got to go to China. Anytime you're attacking somebody and they're waiting for you, they have significant. Uh, they're firing from their airspace. They're firing from their airfields. You know what I mean? Um, the issue of a surface fleet in modern missile warfare um, um, and, and, I, and, and, and I'll even say this, taking into account the fact that in a peer-to-peer -peer exercise, there's a good possibility that there's anti-satellite missiles used and that you may get your <laughs> satellites may get blinded. But at any rate, um, currently, your thoughts on that surface fleet current, with current miss missile technology? Well, again, um, <clears throat> I'll defer to Andre on the Navy stuff because um, I think his uh, background is on a ship. Um, <laughs> I was a Marine. Uh, my background was getting off of ships. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, General Berger is the current uh, commandant of the Marine Corps, and um, I have a lot of respect for him because one of the first things he did when he came in as the commandant 
is he reviewed the national security strategy of the United States and then the national defense strategy. These are the documents that you receive your guidance from. And he is the commandant of the Marine Corps uh, will receive his guidance, what the Marine Corps is supposed to be able to do. And he said, you know, when I read what they want me to do, especially in the South China Sea and all that, I realize we can't do it and we haven't been able to do it for years. He said, we've been married to legacy concepts. See, the Marine Corps has this big memorial in Washington, D.C., the, the Iwo Jima Memorial. And yeah. we're very proud of it because we get this sick, perverse notion that it's really cool to lose 5,000 guys going over a beach so we could build a memorial so everybody says, wow, Marines are cool. But dead Marines aren't good Marines. They're just dead Marines. This is why in the 1980s, when I came in, we embraced something called maneuver warfare. And the idea was to avoid going over the beach and losing guys. You avoid the, where the enemy's strongest and you go around them. But we still retain the legacy of the amphibious uh, battle group, uh, sort of the Marine Corps version of the carrier battle group, where we have these big landing platform docks, LPDs, LHAs, helicopters, and we put all these Marines on these ships. So each ship has a battalion plus of Marines, and we head them in, and then we do what we did in World War II. We park ourselves off the coast, and then Marines disembark, and they circle around in their and tracks, and then they move into Red Beach and Green Beach and Orange Beach. And but Berger said, You'll never even get to do that because as you come in, the enemy is going to hit you with missiles that we can't defend against. They're going to hit the ship, and all the Marines die instantly because look, 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 Davy Jones' locker just took them because they sank. Um, and he said, We can't accomplish the mission we've been given. So he did something innovative, he took for th uh. 1st Marine Division, which is the Pacific Division, and 3rd Marine Division, which is the other Pacific Division. And he said, we're going to reorganize. First thing he says, we're getting rid of tanks. And there's a lot of Marines like myself that went, what? Why are you getting rid of tanks? We've always had tanks. And he said, yeah. And what good do they do us? Um, especially if we're going to fight the Chinese in the South China Sea. Don't need tanks. They're expensive. Get rid of them. Military police, don't need them. Get rid of them. Uh, we're going to restructure. We're going to go from the standard... Marine Corps structural organization, which is built to do old school, you know, amphibious ops. And we're going to turn this something different. We're going to become smaller units. We're going to be able to do things like uh, long range fires. So the Marine Corps, that's always been, I, I was an artillery officer, not artillery officer. I mean, I was an intelligence officer in an artillery unit trained in fire support as a forward controller, uh, forward observer, aerial observer, aerial controller. Um, so I could direct artillery fires. And man, we need it. We like getting close to the enemy because then, you know, you call in fires, you blow them up. It's sort of cool. Um, we don't want to be that close. Long range fires. So we're, the Marine Corps is talking about getting the long range fires business. Why? To take on the Chinese, we're going to have to like take one island, use it as a fire support base to take another island. And it's going to be like the, uh, you know, little island hopping campaign. Hopping, yeah. um, <laughs> but, it, but it's going to be small so that if they hit one of our ships, we don't lose you know, a thousand Marines, we lose 60 Marines. Um, and, you know, and, 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 or, and he's doing that because it's a new way to fight the war. Um, nobody else is doing that right now. The Navy's not. The Navy's not taking a hard look at the carrier battle group. They're married to a legacy system. Um, and they're going to die if they, if they go to war. That's just a, a statement of fact. And I'll, and I'll also say this, and Andre, you, again, correct me, uh, please, because this is your area. But, um, the idea that submarines are all that they're made to be is, 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 I'm telling you right now that they're, and I don't want to get too far ahead here, but um, if a satellite can find a blue whale underwater, it can find a submarine underwater. So the notion that these submarines are out there and nobody knows where they are, I think is a fundamentally flawed notion. I think except, the day of, except when they go to, several hundred meters correct and then it becomes completely different game but yes you can uh, actually visually you can easily visually if you are on the uh, aircraft and about what a thousand two thousand feet in the air you would see you will see in a submarine in a good weather in a good weather you will see it probably at around 30 meters you will 
physically see it, you know. So, but of course, once the weather stops being nice, which is most of the time, and you don't have the steel and all that thing, yeah, then it becomes difficult. But yes, there are kinds of the detection methods methods today, anti-submarine warfare, never stands still. And they even what is called the standing wave, because the satellites and modern radar supposedly can detect if on the certain depth, let's say 100 meters, submarine still displaces a little bit of the hill, so to speak, on the surface of the uh, ocean, and they sort of can take, uh, you know, can, can detect it, but it's one of the other methods, but it's mostly corroborative, you know, the same as uh, uh, MAD, magnetic anomaly detector, it's not the targeting instrument, it's corroboration. You use it for corroboration, but once you know that, oh, it's somewhere in this area, you begin to throw the real deal. Sonar boys, you know, and you begin to try, uh, uh, attack it in a completely different way. So, yeah, the technology doesn't stand, but here is the issue again. You know, uh, even... Uh, I, anti-submarine warfare is a horrendous issue. I know my thesis in our academy was anti-submarine. We had the, the saying, you know, you see this uh, anti-submarine warfare officer, come to him, hug him, give him some money, you know, because their life is so miserable. You know? So, And this is certainly true, you know, and, uh, but it's quite absolutely correct. I mean, and again, modern weapons, uh, just give me the targeting. And that, for example, that is why Russia uh, flies her Liana satellites. They are not like American satellites, which provide uh, targeting. They fly at around, what, 200, 300 kilometers, low Earth orbit. Russians uh, got their Liana, which is the targeting system and other intelligence systems, about 550 kilometers. And no anti-satellite weapon really from, the, uh, from uh, ships can reach them there. They cannot shoot them down from that orbit. So, but then, of course, we have the whole other can of worms here, which are, of course, space warfare, and that's the whole other thing altogether. You know, so it's just, yeah. But, we, but, uh, but, but the point, the point that I, I, I made, you, you made the point about what Shoigu said. I don't need to have a carrier. I just need to sink yeah, your carrier. Right. Yeah. And the Chinese don't need to match our submarine fleet. They just need to sink our submarine fleet. Well. And, Chinese have issues with their submarine fleet, and the best anti-submarine warfare asset, guess what? It's another submarine. <laughs> yes, no, I, I, I'm not disagreeing, but now we get into space. Um, and, and this is the Achilles heel of, 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 of the United States, because we, for the last 20 years, have been fighting war, uh, what we call um, basic broad spectrum uh, warfare. Yeah, yeah. Um, where we, you know, total, total spectrum dominance. I mean, um, dominance yeah. And so, you know, and that works when you're killing wedding parties in Afghanistan, you see, because oh, God, we can, yeah. we, we have perfect intelligence, perfect operations, everything's perfect. And then we can go kill a wedding party. Um, and I'm being facetious, but I'm not because as perfect as our intelligence was, we killed wedding parties. We yes. didn't kill the bad guys. They beat us, but we still, everything worked. Well, you know, what's not going to work. And right now, Ukraine has this artificial sense of accomplishment because they have perfect NATO intelligence, perfect American operational planning, perfect logistics, perfect communications, and all of this is happening. And, uh, and so they have, it's a force multiplier. So they can take their artillery, which is in, you know, insufficient numerically, but they can make it appear to be better than it really is because they're getting great intelligence support, great targeting support, et cetera. They're still not winning, but it makes them feel bigger. Yeah. If this was a war, and remember we talked about that right at the beginning, the difference between a special military operation and a war. If this was a war, all those satellites shut down. None of that communication takes place. None of that targeting takes place. Nothing takes place. They go dumb. And this applies for everything the United States does, from the ground to submarines to aircraft carriers to airplanes. We need perfect intelligence, perfect yeah. communication, and we're not going to have that. And, in real war, uh, yeah. yeah. And whereas the Russians actually, yeah. uh, while they have good good capabilities, the Russians are capable of operating in an imperfect environment. In fact, they train to operate in an imperfect environment. They don't require total spectrum dominance. They just required one boot to go in front of the other boot with an AK in uh, you know, M in their hand and a tank that's going to 
turn on when you say turn on. And uh, they, 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 they use radios, they use old fashioned tools, they draw lines on maps, because that's what war is going to be in the future. In modern warfare, you're not going to have guys with laptops doing this that require a satellite link because there won't be a satellite to link you. Um, uh, Andre, <laughs> uh, if you don't mind, one other thing I'd like to ask you, and that is about um, anti-aircraft, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the um, anti-aircraft networking issue. The U.S. has operated in, you know, the so-called war, war on terror and where they their aircraft flew, you know, really unopposed. You know, they may have some, you know, a handheld stuff here and there, but for the most part, they weren't facing a sophisticated network of anti-aircraft um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, opposition. There's this talk, oh, we we're going to send F-16s, which last time I checked, they were brought into service in, in 76. Not saying they haven't been upgraded, but we're not talking about a brand new airplane. But at any rate, but again, even if they bought, they brought them in, whatever the case, or if there were that competition between NATO and the U.S., the, 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 these, the NATO and U.S. pilots, no, well, not just them, no one in this world has faced the kind of sophisticated anti-aircraft network that Russia has put together. Your thoughts on that anti-aircraft network and what we're talking about here? Uh, or on record for years, uh, uh, any air force in the world, the most sophisticated, the most stealthy, the most numerous, like Mr. Rashmanik uh, from RAND, who he is a specialist in the uh, air operations there in RAND. In 2017, he said, oh, we need, you know what, uh, some kind of, what, 62 air wings to beat Russia in Ukraine. In 2019, he changed the tunis and we, we won't be able to lift half of those airplanes because they will be, you know, annihilated on their uh, runways. But then, of course, you go in and uh, Russian uh, uh, air defense have been always in modern times, we're talking about 70s and 60s, uh, 60s and 70s. It was always networked. It was one of the uh, uh, first experience of fully blown net centric warfare, which uh, of course improved with the processing power. And now when you have the, uh, by the way, yesterday, they there is a rumor, I didn't read yet confirmation, but it looks like they want to take the troops, army air defense and get it back into the air space forces. So the army will stop having its own organic air defense forces. But it's, I mean, they do it for organizational reasons. But the point is there, if you look at the plethora of Russian missiles and their missile complexes, it's unprecedented. It's just unprecedented. There's nothing like this in the world. Just I'll give you a hint. And this was from, I believe, four years ago, I think, I could be, maybe even earlier. In the first air defense missile salvo, Russia at that time had 6,000 missiles. And this is the first salvo of the air defense. Not to speak about the, uh, the over the horizon, uh, 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 long wave, short wave, middle wave, integrated sensor fused uh, uh, radar and uh, optronic field. So yeah, you cannot get in there. You will be killed basically. The only way you can do it is to stick something, you know, and fly it over the, what's the name of it? Uh, the forest tops, you know, forest top, maybe. And then again, granted that there will be no MiG-31 BM in the area and no A-50, you know, AVAX plane. And if they are somewhere near, then you screwed you. Still not going to do it that well. And the first indication was famous Trump salvo of Tomahawks, clamps on Syria. Those guys shot down 79 missiles out of 103 using only S-1 Panzer and good old book M-1. It's a shocker. That's when it was a shocker. Right now, the performance of the air defense, Russian air defense, it's it just mind-boggling. That is why they want, to, well, they could give it attack arms, and they may be, there will be a couple of leakers. Obviously, you cannot shoot down 100%. But the effectiveness is astonishing. It's just um, mind-boggling. There's nothing like this ever. If you look at Antonovsky Bridge, which was constantly, day in, day out, nonstop barrages of the Heimers, it stood. 
It had like one or two Heimers hit it once in a while, but guess what? They never destroyed it. Russians blew it up when they were basically living. <laughs> Because the air defense was just shooting damn thing down, and now the, there is another this uh, absolutely astonishing thing. You can look it up on the YouTube. It is there. You have Panzer, which is kind of you know, uh, Panzer shoots down those Heimers, and those are essentially you know, uh, it's extremely high uh, speed uh, targets. And when you look at this, just oh my gosh, that is why uh, usually they're for pilots and the aircraft. Of armed forces of Ukraine, their uh, what's uh, their longevity, so to speak, they stay alive and not shut down. Probably first sortier, the first sortier they get shut down and that's it. You know, and it, that's how effective it is. Well, thanks a lot, guys. Scott, uh, where can people find you? I believe it was what is it? ScottRitterExtra.com. ScottRitterExtra.com. Yep. And at real Scott Ritter on Twitter, right? On Twitter, yeah, I've got. I've been told I have to tone it down. Garland Nixon has set a oh. very high standard, so I have to be careful. <laughs> yeah, my gosh, I've made that's crazy. My, you know, my my Twitter story here. I don't even know what to say about that. Yeah, I, after, I, oh gosh, I laughed so hard today. Oh my god, you called, and I was like, oh, oh my god, I cannot believe that. But shows how jumpy they are, actually. Oh my. Yes, god. yes. It, it, well, I'll say this because most of the people here know my story. I think what I really believe my whole international uh, issue with, with Twitter was a big part of it was it was about Nord Stream. I was told, you know, with my tweet and the two countries went bananas, but that 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 they were professionals and intellectuals discussing in Taiwan, discussing online, discussing in China, whether or not Joe Biden had a plan to, like, destroy um Taiwan, and they were specifically saying, does he have explosives set? Does he have things set to blow it up? Does he have sab saboteurs that are in place to blow things up? That, uh, And I'll say this, that was was done by the neocons, because when they sabotage an ally, your other allies are going to look at that and say, you know, do, do they have saboteurs? They know that you can't be trusted. And it, to me, it was just... What I did just kind of uh, 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 was a, a spark. And it's only natural if the three of us together and you see me stick a knife in, in, in Scott's back and he falls and you and I go walking down the street, you're going to keep kind of looking at my hand and feeling your back to wait for the knife to come in. And I think that's the result, Andre. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. But it still has to be funny nonetheless, you know. <laughs> it's <laughs> so... Uh, well, all right. And you are what's your uh, Andre also has a great YouTube channel. I never miss anything on there. I watch it. A lot of great stuff. What's your smooth uh, YouTube channel? Uh, Andre? Gosh, Smoothie X12. Smooth. And do you, uh, do you still maintain your blog, your um, your blog? Oh, yeah. My blog, I practically update it every day. And uh, yeah. It's, it's, and it's, it's, what is the, the name? Where can they find your blog online? It's called the reminiscence of the future. At smoothiex12 at blogspot.com. There we go. This Good old smoothie. Moniker stuck to me for now 15 years, and I have even, ah, uh, yeah, it's just <laughs> smoothiex12. That's where you find them. Thanks a lot, guys, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, we guys. Are... All, My right. Pleasure. All right. I'm going to see if I can figure out how to get you guys out of here. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. I will talk to you soon. Oops. Here, my uh, well, that was a lot of fun. And uh, please do me a favor, share this with all of your um, share this on all your social media platforms. Make sure everyone hits the big um, like button. We got 3,183 people. That means we have to have 3,183 likes. If you can help the channel out, there's lots of stuff scrolling across. We've got patreon.com. If you can become a Patreon, that'd be great. We got uh, uh, uh we've got of course, Cash App and uh, to follow me on Telegram and PayPal in uh, any way you can help the channel is appreciated, um, certainly. And don't forget Rockfin, R-O-K-F-I-N, rockfin.com. Make sure you join me on Rockfin. Um, and uh, so that, you know, if they toss me off of YouTube, um, you can still have a way to find me. Thanks a lot, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. I had a great time. I, I thought everybody would really, uh, really enjoy that. I'm going to look at getting those guys back again sometime. Have a great evening.